Hello, my name is Gretchen Baskerville, and I'm the author of The Life-Saving Divorce. I've been a Christian divorce recovery leader in churches since 1998, so I'm really honored to be asked by Bob and Polly Hamp of the Think Differently Academy to speak at this year's Reclaim Conference. I admire the work they're doing because so few therapists are really trained in abuse and trauma recovery. So today my topic is seven reasons to have hope for your children after abuse and divorce. Let me say right up front, as a devout person of faith, I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I believe that God meant marriage to be loving, undefiled, and lifelong. But what happens when our marriages are the opposite? What happens if the home is unsafe? Today, I'm talking about the pros and cons of divorce for kids. This talk is not for someone who wants an I'm bored divorce, or an I feel unfulfilled divorce, or I miss the party life divorce. It's for people who are considering a divorce for very serious reasons, what I call the life-saving reasons, a pattern of sexual immorality, physical violence, chronic emotional coercion, life-altering addictions, abandonment, or severe neglect. They aren't people who are looking for a grass is greener divorce. They're looking for relief, and that's what we'll discuss today. We've all been told that we must stay for the kids, even in situations that are driving us into despair. But have you noticed that very few people talk about how abuse and betrayal in a home affect those kids. The reality is that toxic homes are worse for kids than divorce is. Here's what we'll cover today. A quick history lesson on divorce. Seven false messages about kids in divorce. And seven answers to those claims from the past 30 years of research. When is divorce good for kids? And when is it bad? Now, I'm going to tell you the big takeaway right up front. When the marriage is good, divorce is bad for kids. When the marriage is bad, divorce is good for kids. Where there are serious problems in a home, it is often an unsafe place, both for kids and adults. It's not that warm nest in the storms of life that a marriage ought to be. And researchers have documented it. Now, I'm not a licensed counselor, a psychologist, or a family sociologist. I'm a Christian divorce recovery leader, but I've learned a lot in the past few years from reading the actual scientific studies about kids and divorce, not relying on quotes I see on other organizations' websites. I also want to thank my pastor's wife, who's a licensed marriage and family therapist, who sent me many of these studies and got me started. I have listed the source for each of these studies on the slides so you can verify them yourselves. So here are the seven false messages about kids and divorce. Let's face it, any mature person like you or like me who took marriage seriously knew there would be ups and downs. We were willing to go the distance. We knew there would be times for patience and forgiveness. We weren't quitters who took the easy way out. We wanted to live a righteous life. We wanted to be seen as mature, committed people who sacrificed for the good of our children. We didn't want anyone to judge us. So we gave our destructive marriage 100%. We stayed because of these seven false messages. Those messages pressured us to stay in a destructive marriage. Now, let's take a look at them. We are told that these are universally true about all divorces and all divorcees. But let's take them all apart. Myth one, divorce will destroy your kids. Myth two, if you divorce, your kids will divorce themselves and they won't value marriage. Myth three, it's always best to stay for the kids. Myth four, if you divorce, your kids will suffer even more than they are now, and it'll never get better. Myth five, your kids are likely to be abused by a new stepdad if you divorce and remarry. Myth six, divorce itself, just that act, causes most of a child's problems. Myth seven, kids are likely to abuse drugs or alcohol or have severe behavior problems in school if you divorce. I want to give you a quick history lesson. Most of us are 
younger than 70 years old. And that means most of us don't remember the United States before no-fault divorce laws passed state by state starting in 1969. It was championed by then Governor Ronald Reagan. But believe it or not, there was a time when you could go to court, ask for a divorce, bring evidence to a judge of your husband's violence or financial fraud or emotional cruelty or serial adultery. And the judge could say, nope, divorce denied and send you back home to your spouse. And you had no recourse. So in 1970, after no fault divorce laws went into effect, one state at a time, the floodgates opened. And all the people who were in abusive or unfaithful marriages, but didn't have enough proof or a good enough attorney or enough money to even hire an attorney, finally escaped. The university professors and researchers jumped on this opportunity to study this major change. That was the year that an army of family sociologists started studying the effects of divorce on society, on domestic violence, on suicide, on homicide, and especially on kids. What a perfect opportunity to do a long 10, 20, 25 year studies. So there is an amazing amount of research starting 50 years ago. From 1970, for the next 14 years, the majority of US states passed no fault divorce laws and the pent up demand for divorce went through the roof. It hit the peak in the early 1980s, you see the circle there, and has declined since then. In fact, the divorce rate today is about the same as it was 50 years ago. People always say, well, of course the divorce rate has dropped. Fewer people are getting married. And while it is indeed true that the marriage rate has dropped and cohabitation has increased, that does not affect this graph because it's looking at percentages of married people who've gotten divorced, not the number of people. So if you're a skeptic or a numbers geek, I've put the formula at the bottom of this slide. So myth one, divorce will destroy your kids. The truth? About eight in 10 kids have no long-term serious problems after divorce. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about these myths and I put them in the category of fear bombing because almost none of them are true. And those that have a kernel of truth in them are not as bad as we were led to believe. In many cases, kids from divorced homes do pretty well. And where there are differences, they're not as big as well-meaning friends want us to think. And I'll show you what I mean. So as I said, the truth is that about eight in 10 kids from divorced homes have no serious lifelong emotional, psychological, or social problems at all. Now, some critics are gonna misquote me and say, Gretchen denies that kids feel any pain or sadness or any grief. Gretchen is claiming that kids just sail through divorce without any negative feelings at all. And that's not what I'm saying. I know that children will likely feel pain, sadness, confusion, and grief. Mine did. They may miss the other parent and cry a lot. Mine certainly did. But on average, kids go back to their normal level of emotional health after the first two stressful years. Having two years of additional stress from moving, finding a new school, making new friends are very different from having serious emotional, psychological, or social problems for the rest of their lives. Now, if you've got one of those one in 100 hostile divorces, then your kids are going to endure more than two years of stress. Now let's look at the other side of this graph. This shows that nine in 10 kids from two parent intact families have no serious problems, but one child in 10 does. So the idea that being brought up in a two parent married home guarantees automatic immunity from all serious problems is false. There is simply a certain percentage of our population that has serious issues. 
So what did these early family researchers find? Here's a quote from Dr. Mavis Hetherington. She was one of the pioneers who jumped on this right away in the early 1970s. She followed 1,400 families for 30 years. This is what she said. In the short run, divorce is brutally painful to a child, but its negative long-term effects have been exaggerated. And we'll talk more about this later. Myth two, if you divorce, your kids will divorce themselves and they won't value the sanctity of marriage. The truth is the majority of marriages of kids from divorced homes are lifelong. In fact, the majority of people who marry in the United States have lifelong marriages, and that includes children of divorce. Now, it is true that children from divorced homes are a bit more likely to get divorced. As of 2018, they have a 47% divorce rate. Those people whose parents did not divorce have a 40% divorce rate. In other words, there's not a huge difference between these two groups, only 7%. Now, 30 years ago, that gap was much greater, but the gap has slowly narrowed in the past 25 years. You've probably seen this claim that if you divorce, your kids will view cohabitation favorably. Notice that this 2007 article doesn't distinguish by the level of tension in the home. They lump all divorced families in the same bucket. Perhaps the author missed the research done in the mid-1990s. Now, Dr. Paul Amato of Penn State wondered if divorce affected children differently if the divorce was for serious reasons, not frivolous reasons, a divorce to find relief from an abusive home, for example. He discovered that it did. And then he and Danelle DeBoer asked if the parents' divorce was due to something really serious. Did those children lose respect for the institution of marriage? And they found the kids from troubled marriages have strong commitments to marriage. Amato said, why is it that some offspring with divorced parents maintain a strong commitment to their marriages, even during periods of dissatisfaction? The present study suggests one set of circumstances. That is, hang on, parental divorce may not undermine offspring's commitment to marriage if it ends an especially discordant and aversive parental marriage. In other words, our teenagers and adult kids know what marriage ought to look like. They know that marriage ought to be safe and loving, or at least respectful. They know that an abusive marriage is no marriage at all. Myth three, it's always best to stay for the kids. The truth is, sometimes it's best to leave for the kids. So when is divorce actually good for kids? By the mid-1990s, researchers already knew the difference between divorces that broke up peaceful, loving homes and divorces that broke up scary, tense homes. This is a highly complex chart from Dr. Paul Amato from Penn State, and it compares three different factors. And by the way, the emoji faces are mine, not his. It was created for professors and demographers and grad students. So it's a little hard to get your mind around. I took the same information in this chart and created a little simple visual summary of this in the next three slides. It turns out that family researchers have identified five types of marriages on a continuum of discord, which you can call tension. So from the very low discord on the far left to the very high discord on the far right. Sometimes researchers use the term high conflict versus low conflict or high distress versus low distress, but often that doesn't quite capture the meaning because there may be no visible conflict, no yelling or hitting, no visible discord, especially if you're dealing with someone who is covertly manipulative or someone who's living a secret double life of cheating or pedophilia. So if you don't identify with the word 
discord or conflict, try using the concept of desperation or tension or distress. Now, from the child's standpoint, a low distress home is one where they feel supported, safe, loved, and accepted. In a high distress home where they feel the home is aversive, it's tense. People are walking on eggshells waiting for the other shoe to drop. So basically, divorce is bad for kids if the home feels safe. And divorce is good for kids if they feel the opposite. Keep an eye on that pink face, the high discord marriage. So how bad is an abusive or toxic home for children? Well, researchers found in a high discord marriage, kids whose parents divorced had about one and a half times better well-being than kids whose parents stayed married. Did you hear what I just said? The kids whose parents divorced did better than the kids whose parents stayed you'll see that the divorce did affect them negatively, but the effects of abuse in a toxic married home were even worse. And in the case of very high discord marriages, it was about 10 times better for those kids whose parents divorced than for kids whose parents stayed married. Now, I'm not saying that divorce doesn't affect kids' well-being. I'm just saying that abuse is far worse so the rule of thumb, to oversimplify it a bit, is if the marriage is good or okay, then divorce is bad for kids. If the marriage is bad, divorce is good for kids. So let's look at this diagram. On the left side are parents who divorced when there was no pattern of serious marriage endangering sins in the home. They turned out less positive about their life after divorce. Their children were much more likely to divorce themselves and the kids had lower commitment to marriage. In contrast, on the right side, the parents who divorced to escape a highly toxic home found increased happiness and their kids were not as likely to divorce and had stronger commitment to marriage than kids from the divorced lower conflict homes. Now let's look at myth number four. Your kids will suffer even more than they are now if you divorce. Well, the truth is sometimes divorce reduces and maybe even ends the suffering. Let's look at some of the misinformation. A lot of pastors, Christian marriage book authors, and marriage at any cost organizations sadly love to fear bomb us. It's very easy to find examples of this online. Here are a few. Kids suffer when moms and dads split up. Or for a child, divorce shatters their basic concept of safety. Or this one that says, if you divorce, your kids will favor cohabitation. We're going to address each of these claims. First, as we've already seen, not all kids suffer when moms and dads split up. Some kids are so worried about their loving parent, in this case the mother, they wanted her to divorce and not contest the divorce. Some kids saw divorce as the best solution in a bad situation. The claim that divorce shatters the kids' basic concept of safety assumes that the home was safe to begin with. But as we've already seen, many times the toxic parent has already made the home unsafe. Everyone's walking on eggshells trying to keep from setting them off. So sometimes a divorce is a relief from that constant fear. Then there's this incredibly misleading article, and I'm not going to identify the organization that promotes it, but it never tells you that the outcomes of children after divorce depend a great deal on the toxicity of the home itself. It suggests that all divorces are frivolous and immature, rather than some being life-saving. Now let's look closer at that article. A large part of that article is headlined Wallerstein study. So you would think that this article would accurately describe Wallerstein's findings, wouldn't you? But it doesn't. 
marriage at any cost organizations quote her New York Times bestselling book, The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce, published in 2000. But they seem to only quote her Divorce is Bad for Kids insights, not her Divorce is Good for Kids insights. Dr. Wallerstein began studying 60 families in 1971, and over a 25-year span, made many detailed observations. By the end, in 1996, only 45 families were still taking part in her study. I've read several of her books that discuss this study, and she states that 12 of those 45 remaining families were viewed by their children as being nearly perfect before the divorce. 23 of those 45 marriages were described as being good enough, and only nine of those 45 families had really severe problems that disrupted parenting. That's how she described it. So of this entire study, the vast majority of the families appear to have been very low to average conflict, and only nine were obviously high conflict families. So what is Dr. Wallerstein going to see? She's going to see that the majority of kids from these fairly good homes are struggling in their early life, right? And we could have guessed that. Let's see what she says about these more severe cases. And by the way, where you see underlines or bold type, that's my emphasis of a particular phrase, not hers. So here's the first quote. Children raised in extremely unhappy or violent intact homes face misery in childhood and tragic challenges in adulthood. Or this quote, I'm not against divorce. How could I be? I've seen more examples of wretched, demeaning, and abusive marriage than most of my colleagues. I'm keenly aware of the suffering. I'm also aware that for many parents, the decision to divorce is the most difficult decision in their lives. They cry many a night before taking such a drastic step. Now, Wallerstein had already published a book 11 years earlier saying the same types of things, and she was already seeing marriage at any cost organizations misinterpret her to say all divorce is bad for kids. So she pushed back in her new 2000 book. Here she is protesting about how her work has been misused. And I am, of course, aware of the many voices on radio, on television, and in certain religious circles that say divorce is sinful. But I don't know of any research, mine included, that says divorce is universally detrimental to children. Here's what Wallerstein said in 1989, more than 30 years ago. Although our overall findings are troubling and serious, we should not point the finger of blame at divorce per se. Indeed, divorce is often the only rational solution to a bad marriage. When people ask if they should stay for the sake of the children, I have to say, of course not. Here's Wallerstein talking about the dangers of physical and emotional abuse. Many judges, who deal with such families do not understand that merely witnessing violence is harmful to children. The images are forever etched into their brains. Even a single episode of violence is long remembered in detail. In fact, there is accumulating scientific evidence that witnessing violence or being abused physically or verbally literally alters brain development resulting in a hyperactive emotional system. And here's another quote. But for many people, divorce is the best solution. And staying married for the sake of the children, as it is so often stated, is not the wiser path. When a marriage is cruel, demeaning, or intensely lonely, divorce opens new opportunities to build a better life. The details of such unhappy marriages are often shocking. After she published her 2000 landmark book, Judith Wallerstein was asked, when is the best time to divorce? And here's what she wrote. The trouble is there's no simple answer. 
If there's chronic violence at home, the answer is the sooner the better, unrelated to the age of your child. By violence, I mean physical attacks, hitting, kicking, throwing objects, or chronic threats of physical violence. Exposure to violence has serious consequences for a child's development that may last well into adulthood. They fear for your safety. They fear for themselves and their siblings. If there's repeated high conflict in your marriage, accompanied by yelling, screaming, or pounding the table, then I'd also say the sooner the better. In some high conflict homes, serious differences between the partners are a recurring theme in everyday life. Now, Dr. Paul Amato and his team are also quoted by marriage at any cost organizations. The result is consistent with the notion advanced by a number of observers that children are better off in divorced single parent families than in two parent families marked by high levels of discord. And if that's not clear enough, Amato, Loomis, and Booth concluded that study by saying, our results show that if conflict between parents is relatively high, offspring are better off in early adulthood if the parents divorced rather than if they remained married. So no one told us that abuse was worse than divorce. They told us the opposite. Myth five, if you divorce and remarry, the kids will be abused by their new stepfather. The truth is, Although it happens, the likelihood is low. 25 in 1,000 step families were found to have an incident. So does it happen? Yes, it does, but not as much as people want you to believe. So here are two examples of quotes I found on the internet. The first one says that children are more likely to suffer child abuse if you divorce and remarry or have a boyfriend. Technically, that's true but it's a bit misleading because in reality, the incident rate is not as scary as you might believe. 25 in 1,000 families. That means 975 step families were not found to have a child abuse incident going on. The second quote says that child abuse is 40 times more likely if you have a new partner. Now, this one is flat out wrong. Both of these quotes have problems because they don't show you the figures by family type. Child abuse is one of the most studied problems in sociology. So there's no excuse for not giving the figures or for using a really old study. And that's the problem with the second quote. The article is recent, but it's using 35 year old data. The abuse rate has dropped dramatically since the 1980s. And it's simply not true that step families have a 40 time higher child abuse rate. So let's look at the actual numbers. In the last study by family type that I could find, the NIS4, researchers found that about four in 1,000 married biological parent families had an incident of child abuse, and about 25 in 1,000 step families had an incident of child abuse. It's significantly higher with boyfriends. Now, is this something to be concerned about? Absolutely. If you have any suspicions about the person you're dating, or if you remarry and suddenly discover abusive traits, get to safety. But the idea that your second marriage automatically will be a disaster because your new husband will definitely abuse the kids just isn't supported by the numbers. Myth six, divorce itself causes all the child's problems in adulthood, not the tension that has flooded the home for years. The truth, damage from toxic homes can show up in kids long before the divorce. As you recall, even in two parent married homes, one in 10 kids have serious issues. But where does that additional damage come from? From the divorce itself, or from problems in the marriage that existed long before the divorce. 
Let me quote this Harvard educated professor, Dr. Bella De Poalo. When children of divorced families have problems, sometimes those problems started when the parents were still married. For example, Researchers who followed the children of married parents for more than a decade, not knowing in advance whether the parents would stay married or divorce, found something very telling. Among those children whose parents did divorce and who had problems, sometimes their difficulties began as early as 12 years before the divorce. They were already struggling when their parents were married. Now, many of you are going to say, my kids knew nothing. We never argued in front of them. They didn't know about their father's infidelity or porn or pedophilia or alcohol or financial abuse. And all I can say is that kids sense far more than we think they can. They may not know the details, but they know something is wrong and that a home shouldn't be like this. Dr. Andrew Churlin is another family researcher whose name you'll find on many of the Marriage at Any Cost websites. And more than 20 years ago, he found that seven-year-olds can exhibit problems many years before their parents divorced. I've looked, but I haven't seen either of these two quotes on any Marriage at Any Cost website. Here's how he explains why people jump to the conclusion that divorce causes the child's problems later when they're adults. Part of the seeming effect of parental divorce on adults is a result of factors that were present before the parents' marriages dissolved. So what he's saying is damage was done to the kids long before the couple finally divorced. And he says... It's likely that, in many cases, elevated behavior problems at age seven were a reaction to other sources of stress in the family, such as continual marriage conflict, substance abuse, or violence. The truth is, the damage we see in some children of divorce is from the stress in the home, not the divorce itself. Before I tell you about the ACE study of 1998, I want to say something. No one at my church ever told me about the ACE study. Not my pastor, not the church counselors, and not the Christian radio programs I listened to. We just didn't know. But family researchers have known this for a long time. If there's abuse in your home, early intervention is required. Doctors and researchers have known since 1998, thanks to this massive 17,000 participant ACE study through Kaiser Permanente, that children who've been abused or witnessed abuse, substance abuse, or mental illness, such as destructive personality disorders, are at a higher risk when they become adults for major diseases. The more categories they've been exposed to, the higher the risk is, including increased risks for alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide attempts, plus an increase in smoking, high number of sexual intercourse partners, and sexually transmitted diseases. So let's look at the 1998 list of adverse childhood events. Psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence against mother, and later that was changed to all intimate partner violence, or living with household members with these problems, substance abuse, mentally ill or suicidal, and criminal behavior, meaning ever imprisoned. But I never heard this from anyone, did you? They always just told us that getting divorced would correlate with our children having multiple sex partners, but this study correlates the ACEs with having multiple sex partners. Now, years later, they did add parents' divorce to this list, bringing it up to eight categories. And that makes sense because we know that divorce in lower conflict homes genuinely is damaging to kids. What I'm trying to say is, the world has known about the dangers of abuse and destructive families for more than 20 years. Why didn't we know? Myth seven, 
kids are likely to do drugs or alcohol or have major behavior problems if you divorce. The truth, kids of divorce are only slightly more likely to have these problems. Now, let's take the claims that your children will have tragic lives if you divorce. Remember how well-meaning friends would tell us that our kids would have behavior problems in school, that they do drugs and alcohol? We were told that a married home was the gold standard, that kids from married homes spectacularly outperformed single parent families. The problem with this is that they don't. Kids brought up by single parents often do the same in these studies or only slightly worse than two parent married families. I would suggest that it's not marital status that makes people good, it's character. It's your love, your warmth, your reliability, your sacrifice and your commitment to your children that's so important. Now let's look at the chart. It's from the early 2000s. The green is the percentage of 12 to 17 year olds who had substance abuse problems. The white is kids in that type of family that didn't. Starting from the top, the best family arrangement in this case is a mom plus a dad plus another adult relative, maybe a grandma or an aunt or uncle. Only four in 100 kids in these types of families have substance abuse problems. Next, a mom and dad family or a mom and stepfather family were found to have five in 100 kids with a substance abuse problem. Single moms have only six in 100 kids with substance abuse problems. Now look down there at other relative only. That's probably a grandparent or an aunt or uncle. Even grandma does a great job with only eight in 100 kids having substance abuse problems. So maybe the real question should be, why do single parents do so well in these studies? Why are they almost as good as two parent married homes? I believe it's often that the single parent is the one who showed the most love, sacrifice, and encouragement to the children. To me, it says, if you're a mother with minor children and have parents who love you and are capable of helping you, consider moving closer to them. Bottom line, divorced parents do a pretty good job bringing up children. Now, let's take a look at this study from the 2000s on school misbehavior by family type. Now, someone told me that kids of divorce were 60% more likely to have major behavior problems and pointed me to this article. This article portrayed some national data in a way that suggested to my friend that children of divorced parents were doomed. This graph looks scary. It looks like kids from divorced homes are a lot more likely to get suspended or expelled from school. But look at the scale of the graph. It's zoomed in. It shows only 16%. What if we saw it more realistically at 100%? Here's how it looks at 100%. Not so scary after all, is it? Hardly any kids from any type of family get expelled or suspended. Look at the medium blue line. Only five in 100 kids from married birth parent families do. Look at the bright pink line. Only eight in 100 kids from separated or divorced mom families do. See the green line? Only eight in 100 kids from single birth dad families do. Heavens, look at the yellow line. Even never married moms do a pretty decent job. But did you notice something? Do you see who has the lowest rate? Look at the dark blue line. Widowed moms or dads were found to have the lowest rate of having a kid with substance abuse problems. Only four in 100 kids. Perhaps that's due to all the loving people who surround them and give them encouragement and support and bring all those casseroles. So don't let anyone mislead you to believe that two parent married homes bring up perfect children and single parent homes are tragic and only bring up broken, destroyed children. Whenever you hear such a claim, you need to be instantly suspicious because to me, 
these findings show that character, love, support, and encouragement count far more than marital status. I promised you seven myths, and I'm going to give you eight. Here's your bonus myth. Your children will always resent you for divorcing and ruining their lives. But the truth is that many children look back on a life-saving divorce as the best solution in a bad situation. No, I don't have a peer-reviewed study to support my claim here. All I've got are the results of a non-scientific poll I did in my life-saving divorce private Facebook group. I asked more than 1,000 members, many of whom are conservative or homeschool families, this question. Is at least one of your children glad you're divorced? And eight in 10 respondents said yes, that one or more of their children is glad they got divorced. One in 10 said they didn't know, and almost one in 10 said no. So eight in 10 of the parents in my group who responded said their kids favored their divorce. Now, this is a picture of my two children. They're all grown up today. They're adults. Uh, I divorced 25 years ago, and I'd like to read this letter that my daughter wrote to me and gave me permission to share with you. In today's culture, being a kid from a divorced family can be a source of shame and pity. But in my experience, it was far from the unfortunate upbringing culture made it out to be. After my parents' divorce, I grew up in a home that was peaceful, where despite there being conflict here and there, I knew I was loved and cherished. Most of my friends grew up in homes with married parents. While some of my friends had family units that functioned well, there were others where you couldn't help but feel an undercurrent of undermining, criticism, and tension. Whenever I visited their homes, I knew I was the fortunate one. I wouldn't trade my small, loving family for anything. Let's look at what other Christian divorcees reported. Here's one. My daughter started asking me to leave when she was 14. She was worried about me. Or this woman who said the word glad wasn't quite the right word, but said, my children all agree divorce was the right thing. Or this one. Two of my three children told me they didn't know how I stayed with him so long. Or this one. All three are very glad and relieved and wished I had done it sooner. So how do you decide? Well, that's up to you. If you do decide to divorce, remember that it's good for children to know that the divorce was not for frivolous reasons, not due to boredom or missing the party life. It was due to something serious. You can hold your head high because you truly invested to make this marriage work. You tried hard. You gave it all you had. But don't bash their dad or demand that your children side with you. It's important to state your truth, but it's also important to let them process it in their own time. So what's the summary? When the marriage is good, divorce is bad for kids. When the marriage is bad, divorce is good for kids. Thank you so much for watching. I pray the Lord will restore the years the locust ate for both you and your children. The healing starts when you get to safety. If you wish, leave me comments. You can go to lifesavingdivorce.com forward slash contact. Again, lifesavingdivorce.com contact. May God bless you.